kind of stalling because Daryl's right out the door. He's making some copies over in the office. Is this the copy machine working? Well, let's hope that it is. What is, what is change? It said the lesson says preparing for change. What are we preparing for? What's the change that we're preparing for? What is constantly changing? Well, yeah, life. It's con we get older. There's change in connection with that. We, um, some friends uh, uh, leave us, and, and uh, we make new friends. There's change there. Um, what? Absolutely. It says here, the only thing that does not change is the reality of change itself. Knowing full well that things are going to be different. I look forward and am and gratified that the world made new is going to be different. There are going to be some similarities, but it's going to be different. It's going to be different. We're not going to find sickness and pain and suffering and crying and all that kind of stuff. It's not going to be the way it is now. And here he comes. <laughs> Did I miss the memo? Uh, what, you, you mean that we started earlier? Yeah. Yeah. It's in the bulletin. <laughs> you, don't get the bulletin. you didn't get the bulletin, did you? <laughs> it's all right. We forgive. We forgive you. It's, it's change. That's yes, change, change. <laughs> it's change. We need to get used to change. I have this one and the other. I'll just stand here and mumble while you're getting ready. Good. Good. <laughs> we started talking about change. What, what is change? What changed when Adam... Gotta help me. I suspect they did. She made sure. Yeah, I bet she did. I bet she did. I'm, I don't mean that in a, in a, in a uh, derogatory way, but I bet she made changes and... And set him, set him straight, so to speak. Yeah. You okay? Am I on? Power. Am I on? Can you hear me? Okay, no. All right. Oh, yeah, there we go. Now we got some sound. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you, Ben. All right. Well, let's have prayer before we get started. Father in heaven, we thank you that you love us. We thank you for your blessing and your protection on each of us this past week. And this morning as we spend time 
in your word. We ask that you would please send your Holy Spirit to bless and guide us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, curious uh, question for you is, um, so what, what caught your attention this week? Anything happened this week that you thought was, wow, that's interesting? What's that? Notre Dame. Notre Dame. Yeah. Interesting. Most famous in quotes church in the world. Maybe second only to St. Peter's, but even there are people who were saying that Notre Dame was even more significant than St. Peter's. Yeah. So, um, it's a question for you. Is it really a church? Ah. Isn't that interesting? You know, that thought went right through my head as I was watching that. Is, it a, is there any significance to the fact that the most important or significant or universally recognized Religious. pagan altar burned down this week? Or burned. Didn't burn down, but it You know, I don't want to make too much of that, but, you know, it's interesting to think about. Yes, Doug. Uh, I, I would say the, the stuff that I've read indicates that it's unifying Catholics. They're coming together over this, this topic, you know, so it's got kind of a unification. Yeah, well, I noticed, I noticed that too. I, I agree, they are coming together over the relics, okay? But they're not coming together together over the expense it takes to fix it. <laughs> yeah. You notice that? Yeah, there's a lot of uh, controversy on that whole thing. Yeah, the, this is a, a, uh, a building that held all kinds of relics and icons, uh, pagan worship. Yeah, 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 exactly. And uh, the, uh, it's the state that's going to take on the rebuilding. It's not well, let me ask you a question. Who... Who owns the Notre Dame? Who owns it? Yeah. I would think the Catholic Church does, although I've never looked it up. I don't know. No, the Catholic the Notre Dame is owned by the French government. Is it still Notre Dame? Yeah. Okay. okay. It was. It was. It was um, confiscated during the French Revolution, and it was rededicated during the French Revolution to the cult of reason, and they had very elaborate ceremonies that took place in it, um, worshiping, if you will, reason, in exact, you know, intentionally designed to, to uh, destroy any Christian, and again, I put that in quotes. Subsequently, it was then rededicated again from the cult of reason to the cult of the supreme being. Or no, no, higher being, higher being, I think it is. Again, same uh, idea. Um, we really aren't going to identify who this being is. Um, it's not God. But Napoleon recognized that society needed some kind of a focal point you will, other than just a nebulous reason concept, which was kind of hard for people to get a grasp on. But if you talk about a supreme being, well, then people are able to kind of get their minds around that. But again, it was not a Christian. It was, it was anti-Christian. Yes, Doug? My, son, my youngest son, they did it in, in 
in high school, they did a trip to Europe. Oh, yeah. And one of the places they went was... Oh, she went to Paris. Was to Paris in the yeah. cathedral. And it was interesting. He was saying this is a group of kids from Adventist schools. Mm -hmm. And they came out of there actually feeling insulted mm -hmm. at the opulence. Mm -hmm. That, that it, it was almost a turnoff to their Adventist belief. Because th this represented religion, but they didn't represent the religion that, that these Adventist kids recognized. You know, and so it was it was kind of an interesting thing to listen to him talk about this so experience. The Notre Dame is built um, around the architectural design called Gothic. And I didn't really know what that meant until I've been listening and looking and listen, uh, learning some things. But the whole concept behind Gothic architecture in terms of cathedrals in Europe is to create a space in which I, as a worshiper, recognize my insignificance in the big scheme of things. The grandeur of the cathedral, the altar, the transcendence of God, here is where I recognize my nothingness, if you will. And it's true, you go into some of those churches, I mean, it's like, wow, I mean, who built this? When you think about it being built with wood scaffolding and rope and pulley and chisel and hammer. It was the place that, that engineering was, was tested to its, to sure, its extreme yeah. with the flying buttress sure, and the, yeah. you know, the whole they, they construction. They the roof in, the, in, in that building and uh, the ceiling in that building. And they're not only going to certain how they did it. Yeah. Exactly. Right, which means it's going to be a while before they do it in the original way. <laughs> well, it's interesting times that we live in, and, um, you know, I think the, the important thing for you and I is to keep our eyes open and listen to what is happening and think about what is, what is taking place within the context of the big picture of what's happening. Um, you know, it's, it's fascinating to me that literally within two or three days, boom, you've got a billion dollars pledged. I'm not sure if it's in hand, but it's there. Well, that's pretty amazing um, for a building that may or may not really even be used by worship by very many people. It's more of a tourist attraction than anything. So... These are things to, to keep an eye on, and uh, I think we also need to recognize the fact that God is at play on the field, and um, I don't know why that fire occurred, why it occurred this day, this week, you know, leading up to Easter weekend and all that goes on with that, um, but I think that it's something to keep in mind and, and keep our eyes focused on. You think it's a distraction? I think, that, I think the devil is using a lot of things now to distract people from their spiritual experiences. And, and he's trying to distract them in the sense that, he's, that the, uh, the cathedral and all that it represented represent, represents an alternative uh, worship to the real worship of the living well, that's God. That's interesting. Well, and I'm thinking that... Oh, I see. You're saying... You say, oh. What I'm saying is that, 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 that this is, to me anyway, it seems like a distraction of what's really going on in the world and really going on with human beings and their relationship with God. Depends upon who defines what's really going on. You know, Satan defines what's really going on as people drawing people to him, to his side of the equation. And if this is, you know... What we know is really going on is Jesus is preparing to return. That's in the big, big, yes, it's exactly. Big, big picture. But in terms of what's happening down here, you know, Satan wants to attract attention to a false system. Right. He wants and to, so he wants to distract us from this to this. 
Exactly, and that's what I see happening with the fire in Notre Dame because, you know, it certainly is drawing a lot of attention that would otherwise, eh, big deal. The yeah, exactly. So, well, like I said, keep your eyes open and. Um, you know, it's amazing that, that uh, uh, how can I say this? It's amazing that they neglected that church building to the point where it had it was a fire, kind of a fire trap. And well, it's been a fire trap for 900 years. Well, yeah, but it wasn't that bad for the first two or 300 years. Before it got electricity. Yeah, before it got electricity. Yeah. What yeah. I'm saying is that that building was really quite uh, run down. Yeah. Well, I think that's true for a it's lot massive. of churches in Europe. Yeah, it's I mean, massive that maintaining it is. I mean, actually, it, it's been in worse shape than what it is now in, in the past. Yeah. At the turn of the century, it was in. Yeah, survived the war, but it wasn't a True. In the dark ages, it was almost just black. Nobody, yeah. you know. Anyway, uh, like I said, keep your eyes open, your ears open. And, and so a significant part of that story is that someone attempted to get gas cans in a church in this country. Yes. Ah, yeah. They were going to burn down one of the big cathedrals within this country. Where did that happen? I think it was New York. Now, the other interesting thing to keep in mind is that, um, and this was not something that you, you, you will find in the press because it really isn't being talked about, but actually what happened at Notre Dame with the fire that occurred there is only one of many, many similar types of events that are taking place in churches all across France. There are multiple churches that are being attacked um, with vandalism, with fire, etc. You don't hear about it, but it is, this is not just an isolated event. And so, again, do you, get, do, you, do you have any sense of the fact that Christianity is under attack worldwide? If you don't, you should. Um, it is. And uh, it's actually under attack in this country, um, very much so by the media. But interestingly enough, um, People who are committed Christians, and I put that in some, you know, I'll, I'll put that in some quotes, are actually becoming more committed. It's not me. I'm not sure whose that is, but anyway. Okay, it says Jonathan, so I don't know. Is that you or him? But anyway. Okay. I forget where we were going. But anyway, let's, let's move into our, our lesson study. Choices. What's that? Oh, are becoming more committed to their Christianity um, as polarization takes place. So there may be less people in this country who are Christian, but who are, are more committed to their Christianity than have been in the past. So, and I think that's, that speaks well of people, but I also think it, it helps us recognize the polarization that is taking place. I talked to a person, I talked to a person, a friend of mine for years. Yes. Yesterday. He asked me about my faith. started telling me he used to go to church and stuff like that. But he asked me if he thought Christianity was going away, or if things were getting better or worse. And so I kind of expressed that to him. You know, it's very interesting. Um, from the liberal humanist perspective, the problems of society are because of Christianity. But let me ask you a question. If you remove Christianity from a society, what happens to that society? It's worse. Exactly. And that's the thing that most people don't understand. That what, what actually makes a society function is the principles that are the foundation of Christianity. And if you remove that, you will have the cultural revolution of China all over again. 
Okay, well, if you have your lesson quarterlies, we are on lesson three, and this one is called Preparing for Change. <clears throat> and I'd like to read the first two paragraphs of this lesson. <clears throat> it says, life is full of changes. Things change all the time. The only thing that does not change is the reality of change itself. Change, in fact, is a part of our very existence. Even the laws of physics seem to teach that change exists in the most basic fabric of reality. Next paragraph, key point. Often, change comes unexpectedly. We are going along in a routine when suddenly, instantly, everything changes, and we are caught completely off guard. Amen. Can any of you relate to that? Mm. You're, you know a lot of stories just talk about sudden change. Yeah, but I mean, I'm sure in your own life you can, you can think of events and times when you were rolling along, you knew what was going to happen, you knew where you were going, and boom, some, something happens and it's all different suddenly instantly everything changes and we are caught completely off guard um, so the goal is not to be caught off guard is that what we're hearing or is, is it, it possible to be caught off, off guard something something that is inevitable is it possible to not be caught off guard Depends on depends on what you're talking about. Okay. Keep because talking. we tend to focus on certain things in our lives, and other things might catch us off guard. Uh, the uh, <coughs> we know what's coming, and what we a lot of us do is try to pay attention to what's going on around us so that we're not caught off guard. Okay. But one thing we know. Mm. One thing I believe. Mm. And that is that even though we have all of the spirit of prophecy, and we have scripture, and we have history, the end of time is going to be not quite like we think it's going to be. Okay. And we could be, and probably will be, caught off guard, but we have to be able to roll with it, and we have to be able to not be crushed by the chain. Okay. So let me ask you a question. Is it possible, um, is it possible to be prepared for change even though you don't know what that change might be? I think so. In other words, there is a mindset that There's, there's two, one, two, you can go through life with a mindset that goes one of two ways. You can either go through it asleep you're just kind of bouncing from wall to wall, sort of staying in the middle of the road, or you can be awake. And when you are awake, you know that there are going to be changes that you're going to have to deal with. Proactive. You're proactively prepared to deal with them. You don't know what the changes are going to be. I mean, like, just, I mean, like driving down the road, you know that there's going to be car parked on the side of the road, there's going to be this, there's going to be that, and you adjust accordingly in going along. Most of the time, that's what we have to deal with. But every once in a while, somebody runs a red light in front of you. Every once in a while, something rolls out in the road that you didn't expect, and you have to respond quickly. Did you see on the news the other day, that, or yesterday, where this uh, police officer uh, stopped in the middle of the, of the highway, the the interstate? No. Because it was a donkey. A donkey? A donkey. <laughs> and she coaxed, she coaxed it off the road, but, but uh, it was a donkey. Yeah, there. all right. Huh. A donkey's a lucky donkey that <laughs> she came along. Something that was unexpected was the flooding we had last week. Yeah, exactly. That unexpected. Put a lot of people unaware. Exactly. But there were some people who were prepared for that, even though they didn't know that was going to happen. In other words, they, were, they could respond to it and take care of it, as opposed to others who were like, ah, what now? I need, I need rescue. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Well, when I drive down the road, especially at night, 
died. Yes? I pay attention to maybe a deer will run across the yes. back. And I look for my right. lights shining on a deer's eye or something off the side of the road because I'm prepared for the possibility. And I go, don't go fast because that possibility is going to be there. Exactly. So you're making adjustments accordingly. Okay. So the lesson then moves into what it calls unprepared. And um, I, I'm not quite sure. So they, they identify three stories, or four actually. Um, our first text that we have is 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 13. And I want to look at really two verses here. Verse 1, this is Paul writing. He says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So Paul is now referring back to when Israel was taken out of Egypt and they started through the uh, wilderness. So he begins, he says, I, don't, I, I do not want you to be unaware. <clears throat> then verse 6. Now these things take place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. What is Paul talking about here? I think he's talking about not becoming complacent with the way the world is. Okay, I'll give you half a point. Anybody else? Close, but not quite. Oh, full point. Yes, okay. One point ahead of you. <laughs> okay, so what is Paul saying here? We can learn from other people's experiences. How to deal with situations that we might deal with today. All right? Uh, let's see, there's a saying that goes something along like this. You know, I couldn't believe how dumb my father was when I was 18 years old. And I was amazed how brilliant he had become when I was whatever, 30. Okay? It's smarter, you get older, isn't Exactly. <laughs> it's like, well, really? <laughs> so what is that saying? You know, I could have learned so much from my father when I was 16 and 17 and 18 years old, as opposed to learning the, 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 by mistakes during my 20s. I, I, you know, I don't think I've ever said that about my father, but you know, you've heard the saying. You ever told him how smart he is? <laughs> I don't know if I've ever said it that way, but yeah. yeah. I've been very thankful for what he has taught me. <clears throat> so, God has given us in the Bible a multitude of stories, examples, illustrations of how people have done some things very well, and even though change caught them unawares, they were able to roll with the situation and come up on the right side. There's also many stories in the Bible of people who did not come up on the right side and made a disaster of the situation because they weren't prepared, they didn't make the right choices. Now, um, I wrote something up here on, on this section here, and I'm going to ask you if it means anything to you. Do you know what the law of unintended consequences is? I don't know if it's written either, but I don't know if it's there, but it's it's uh, it's like be careful what you wish for. Ah, yes. Okay. The law of unintended consequences, and I'll just it's coming out of my head as I'm thinking about it here, basically means there there are consequences to every decision we make, and I think one of the biggest challenges that we have is actually thinking ahead as to what might go wrong here with this brilliant idea that I have that I think is the cat's meow at this moment. 
you know, Adam and Eve. Were they uninformed? Were they ignorant? No. But they didn't really think very far outside the box. And as a result, here we are. Who's they? Adam and Eve. Yeah. So, we have here three or two stories. Three stories? Um, the first one is <clears throat> about Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, they made some decisions. And um, how did that work out? It was an object lesson. Yeah. And it, it's interesting, you know, we talk about the unintended consequences uh, as far as on the negative side. But I think in our Christian experience, we're constantly amazed at how stupid I am and how God can turn it into the most brilliant results. You know, like, whoa, this is nothing to do with me. <laughs> yeah. um, the second story is in Genesis 16, 1 through 6. And this is, of course, the story of Abraham and Sarah. And things weren't going quite as planned. And so... Sarah comes up with an idea, Abraham agrees to go along with it, and what happens? Get ahead of him. Well, we're paying for it, still paying for it. We're, st <laughs> still, we're still living with it. That's exactly right. We're still living with it. Um, you know, that was a, uh, a one-time event that should never have... Uh, Amounted to anything. And yet it was everything. But yet, God knowing the beginning from the end, He knew who that first child would become. I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's like the song that says that God grew the tree that He was crucified on. You know? The consequences had to be played out in order for sin to truly be seen in its full light. You know, so we, we, um, we may see Hagar and that whole thing as this what if it hadn't happened, but it seems like God said it will happen. And it, and it almost had to happen in some form in order for this this... Muslim belief to go against the, the, the Christian belief. It's, it, it, it was kind of a, you know. I know, a, you're, not, I know you're not talking about predestination. But, no, but, it, it, but it some people might it see it that way. Yeah. 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 So the, God's knowledge of the end from the beginning is foreknowledge, but not predestination. No, no. And, 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 and so, yeah, everything happens for a reason. You know, one of the things that I, I hope is a possibility in heaven, and I don't know if this is, would, would be, but, um, you know, what, it would be interesting to know, so what would have been the history of mankind if Abraham and Sarah had not made this mistake? In other words, if Adam and Eve had not Well, of course, yes. I mean that, but but at this point in time, you know, this fork in the road, we know where this fork has taken us. But what would have happened if it had not been taken, and Adam and Abraham and Sarah had been faithful, and we did not have this whole thing? But, so, there, there's an example in in, um, in Moses. Ah, oh, I lost my train of thought. Sorry. Go go. <laughs> the fork in the road. You're looking at it like, uh, what would happen if this and this and this had not happened? Well, let's ask the question, what would the devil have done if Abraham had not acquiesced and made the mistake? Now, don't think for a minute that the devil wasn't prompting him to go forward with it. Oh, sure. Because he was. Sure. But what if he hadn't? 
Well, I'm saying to you that that would never, that wouldn't have converted the devil. He would have found another way yeah. to make Abraham do something foolish. Oh, I know. Okay. Yes, he would have tried to. But again, the only reason that the devil succeeds is because we make the same mistakes that Abraham made. We get the idea, you know, God is, doesn't seem to really understand what's going on here. I think I better help him. I think we need to understand that, that uh, <clears throat> now how, how do I want to say this? Um, the devil attacks us at our weakest points. Yes. And he studies us to know what those weak points are. Yes. Apparently, he attacked Sarah and Abraham at their weakest point which was their desire for this child from God. And, and he, that's, where the, that's where they were most vulnerable, apparently, at that particular time. But they did not have to make that choice. No. Even though they had a desire to, for a son, they could have still said, you know, we, oh, yeah, we don't they, understand, but we're willing to wait. They didn't have to. No, they didn't have to. Right. But what the devil is good at is getting people to step out on enchanted ground, on his ground. And then people tend to lose their, their sense of choice of what they're doing. Once, once uh, Hagar was pregnant, what, 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 did, what could Abraham have done? Oh, I agree. I mean, the, yeah. I agree. He was but, in for a penny and for a pound. But you, you have examples like with Elisha. He, he, he argued with the Lord that, that, that he was the only one that could do it. And God said, no, I've got 7,000 others that could do this if you choose not to. So that's, that's the answer to the question. God, God has apparently a backup, you know, for, for you know, Elisha not going to uh, Jezebel. He had a backup for... Uh, there was a couple others I thought of too, but it, it would seem that in Scripture we're given examples of God telling someone, if you don't do this, I've got somebody else that will. Ellen White. Well, I, I, yeah, I agree, but... <clears throat> we're not getting right at what you're talking about, so are we? I don't know where we're, where we're going. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's no question that our sinfulness is a great potential stumbling block for us. Absolutely. But we don't have to stumble. Yeah, that's, that's the blessing. And, and if, in fact, we don't stumble, God's case is all that much stronger. He, I mean, we, we did not have to have the, the, the sons of, of Abraham at, at each other's throats for 4,000 years. We didn't have to have that, but that's what happened. If it hadn't gone that way, what might have been different? I mean, this great controversy might have been wrapped up in a much shorter period of time. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> that's, that's kind of like the frustration that comes when I read Spirit of Prophecy, and she says, had we done our work. Sure. Right. <laughs> oh, but and, we, and that applies to all of us. Yeah. I mean, because we can all look in our lives as to where we have made stupid decisions that have really set us back and we have to now get back up to speed get things sorted out get the fires put out and then we can move on with other things <clears throat> okay and then the last uh, story that is given here in this unprepared business um, is um, the mother of the um, of john and james james and john <clears throat> brothers the sons of zebedee Mrs. Zebedee. Okay. Um, anything wrong with what Mrs. Zebedee asked of Jesus? Well, anything that a prideful mother would, would want. It, she, she probably thought the kingdom was going to be set up similarly to the way the, the apostles were okay. uh, promoting, that okay. it was going to be a, a literal, temporal mm -hmm. kingdom. And somebody has to do the leading. Right. Somebody has to do the ruling. And I'm certain that she felt her sons were as capable as anyone. Sure. But she misunderstood what, the, what it was all about, and she misunderstood Jesus' role in it, just as, the, just as the apostles did. She wouldn't have asked that question if she realized 
the nature of, the, of, of God's kingdom in reality. Yeah. In other words, she was asking for something that she didn't really understand the potential outcome of this. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's the example of all these, these three stories that we've looked at. I mean, each of these people made a decision anticipating one outcome only to discover there was something else that happened. Yes, Jim. God works out his purpose despite the poor choices that are made and redeems and saves even through that process. Right. You know, I, when I've read this story about Mrs. Zebedee and the two brothers and things here, um, did Jesus actually grant her request? Of course, she didn't realize what it was going to do to her sons right. to be put in the position she was asking for. I mean, all Jesus says is, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am having to drink? Yeah. Yeah. And their answer was, yes, yes we can. Yeah, we drink Mother the cups all the time. Yeah. True, but I mean, the, the two boys answered. Uh, now, I'm going to suspect that in their minds, they had a they had a toe under the tent. But they did not understand the significance of yep. that was going on. Yep. The good news is that having continued on with Jesus, they did not get what they thought they were asking for. But they were still faithful. And so much more. Exactly. And so when, when, when things did not go the way they thought they were, and they were, un, they were really not prepared for that, they were, in a sense, repaired, prepared. And they stood true. Uh, one being martyred early, and the other one, you know, eventually being on the Isle of Patmos. <clears throat> okay. Now, this Sunday has been focusing on events that happened that one is not prepared for. You know, you can't really prepare for some of these things other than to be awake. But now we talk about a variety of things, uh, preparing for marriage, preparing for parenting, preparing for old age, and preparing for death. Um, can you prepare for marriage? Thank you, Jenka, I'll give you a point. So what can we do? to prepare for marriage. Okay. Prepare yourself spiritually and mentally. Okay. Okay. Prepare yourself financially. Okay. Prepare yourself socially. Okay. There's lots of things that you can do to prepare for marriage, but nothing there's nothing like it until it happens. There's nothing like it until it happens. That's right. Okay. Which means that having prepared, anticipate the unexpected. Okay? <laughs> Rebecca, are you listening carefully? <laughs> yeah. You know, um, Paul, uh, we, we look at two verses here. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, and Galatians 5, 22 through 23. And basically, we're talking here about... Um, characteristics of nice people. People we like to be around. All right? And, um, you know, these are characteristics that, first of all, I think, are part of raising a child and, and training them as to how to interact with their siblings or their parents or their neighborhood kids. But somewhere along the line, as we get older, we as individuals have to take ownership of who we are, how we interact with people. And I'll be the first to admit that sometimes I'm 
I do a pretty good job with some of these things. And sometimes you don't. And then sometimes I don't. <laughs> sometimes I don't. And I have to uh, ask for forgiveness. And then, and then you start talking about the longevity. The longevity. Of the relationship. Oh, yes, of course. Right, right. The thing about getting married and living happily ever after. You, sometimes you don't realize the ever after is as long as it is. <laughs> and, and, when, and when you finally settle in yeah. that this is a commitment for life, yeah. then things change again. Yeah. Okay. And then it seems like it goes by in about 30 seconds. <laughs> and, you know, and time, time is the killer, but uh, uh, time is the changer, too. Things change over time. Um, Galatians 5 there it says but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience kindness, goodness faithfulness, gentleness self-control against such things there is no law what is it that is important in terms of preparing for marriage the spirit okay your relationship, your interaction, your engagement with God and spiritual things. Okay, preparing for parenting. One of the outcomes of marriage is children. And uh, if you think getting married is a change in your life, wait until you have a child or two. <laughs> And then you discover how little of the universe you really control. <laughs> That's when you start realizing how smart your parents are. <laughs> yes, right. That is true. That is very true. When you think about your dad. Yes. I think about me and my children. When my daughter turned 50, mm. my daughter turned 50. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and uh, your dad is what, 94? Six. Six, 96. He, he probably never expected to turn 96 yeah. either. And, and whatever's happening yeah. is change yeah, almost every day. Yeah, every day. Yeah. And, and I see that, that I, I, I sit there and I think, you know, I, we've been married 52 years. Yeah. Okay? 52 years. That's a half a century. Yeah. And then I've got a daughter that's 50 years old. Yeah. i got another one that's, what? 45. Almost makes you feel old. <laughs> but then you say to yourself, and this is the truth, yeah. and I always do it, I think, is, wait a second, am I really that old? Yes. Yeah. You know? How did this happen? How did this happen? How did, how did I get there? <laughs> okay, preparing for parenting, let's look at 1 Samuel 1.27. <clears throat> for this child I prayed. And the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Um, what is the context here? This is Hannah. Oh, Hannah. This is Hannah. And uh, it's in 1 Samuel 127. Okay. This is Hannah. Hannah really wanted a child. Yes. Big time. Yeah. Poor old guy. Her, her, her husband. Yeah. The poor guy, he says to her, I don't have enough. Yeah. He's just so out, out to lunch on that <laughs> issue. And, and uh, she did the best she could yeah. cry. And, and, uh, but there is a big difference between people, man and a woman, mm -hmm. husband and wife. There's a big difference between them and their desires and needs and wants and, sure. and, and aspirations for themselves and their kids. It's just, uh, and it takes a long time to get a grip on it, <clears throat> I think. I well, have, I think the, I, I think, grip yet. I think the, the, the point that I think I would make on this that probably is lacking or is often lacking in relationship to children is the fact that um, pregnancy, is something that sort of just happens. Oftentimes, 
People aren't even aware of the fact that they're pregnant until they discover they are. Um, <clears throat> what I get out of this here is that here was a woman who was having difficulty having a child. She was what? Praying. Now, I don't know what her prayer was. I suspect it was, Father, uh, God, I would like a child. But I also would like to believe that she was also praying that if you do give me a child, that I will be the kind of mother that that child needs and deserves. Um, she was praying for her child before the child was even conceived. I think all of us who've had children, you know, we certainly pray for the children after they're conceived, and I'm not sure how much difference that makes, but spiritually she was preparing herself even before a child was even in the picture. The child, the child yes, and, the child, and she was committed to doing that before the child was born or even conceived, yes. <clears throat> All right. Um, the, uh, the lesson made a very interesting point, which I can certainly vouch for, and that is that children do not arrive with a owner's manual. Yeah. Well, yes. Wow. You know, I talk to, I, 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 when I do surgery with patients, we usually do one eye about two weeks apart, and oftentimes patients will comment, that, oh, this eye was very different than the first eye. I mean, from my perspective, we do it exactly the same, but there's a little difference in sen sensitivity and whatever else. And I have learned that what I say to patients, I say, yeah, I said it's just like kids. <laughs> no kid is the same. And everybody knows exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, it's a universally accepted. They're all different. I agree. You agree. Thank you. There you go, Karen. Thank you. <laughs> Same house, parents, same parents, <laughs> total yeah. opposites. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, certainly, if I look at my two children, I can see that. Very, that, that. But there's also a lot of similarities, you know. Yeah, okay. So, um, owner's manual. Even experienced parents are sometimes stumped by the actions, words, and attitudes of their children. And you know, as I look at that statement and I think to myself, my guess is that God has the same thoughts about me sometimes. <laughs> Gensler, you donkey, why are you doing that? <laughs> Haven't we been over this before? I mean, we've talked about this. I thought you learned that lesson back there, and yet here we are, going over the same You've never had that experience? No. <laughs> well, and I think the, 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 the call here for us as parents is to never forget to be as long-suffering and patient with our children as God has been with us. Tough, Tough I know. The last but the most important part of this equation <clears throat> uh, on, on change, Thursday, is preparing for old age. And then also preparing for death. We can talk about your dad for a second there. Too. Yes, okay. I bet you he never uh, had an idea of what it was going to be like in old age. I know I My guess is none of us do either. Mm -hmm. Just because they were old. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a revelation. It really mm -hmm. is. Yeah. To realize that your pain is not because you've got cancer. It's not because, you know, it's because your age. Yeah. Well, I can tell you that, um, you know, providing care for my father um, is a sobering thing because as I walk with my father from his bedroom to wherever we're going in the house, <clears throat> I look at him and I think to myself, 
hmm, there go I in another 20 or 30 years. The Lord willing, I live that long, okay? Um, you know, one of the things that I think has happened in our culture today is that <clears throat> um, old people go to assisted living and nursing homes, and that's where they die. Well, if you have somebody that you're living with every day, I mean, you experience their aging process on a daily basis. But they're also us. And so you look at it and you say, well, I guess that's what it's like. Their aging prepares you for your aging. I think so, yeah. It exactly. should, but yeah. I don't think it really does. Well, I can tell you that I've uh, looked at aging a little bit differently than what I... <laughs> can we? Yes. My mother had Alzheimer's. There's five of us kids. When we get together, we kind of like, uh, which one is this going to go to? You know, are we going to get this? Are we going to get this? How's it going to go? Yeah. And it's that for sure is sobering yeah. because you have no clue yeah. what the end of your life is going to be like. Well, in the lesson here, <clears throat> it identifies three things. It says develop a deep personal relationship or knowledge of God. Um, I think that is found, fun, foundational in terms of an aging process. But number two is develop good habits. And I can tell you that I have patients in my office. Everybody, all, the majority of patients that I see are 60 and older. And I can, I can tell you, I can, well, not always, but I can tell patients who have good habits and patients who don't have good habits. I mean, the aging difference is like night and day sometimes. Cigarette smokers, oh, non alcohol, yeah. you know, you can tell people have lived hard uh, versus they've taken care of themselves. <clears throat> um, I have a very small handful of patients who have three digits in their age. Um, not very many, but there, they, there tend to be people who've taken care of themselves, and it, it, it makes a difference. And then there's always one that they, they throw in there that smokes cigars and drink alcohol their whole life. <laughs> <laughs> there's always one of those. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, my grandmother's remedy for everything was a shot of whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then last but not least is develop a passion for God's mission. What is that talking about? Other people. Other people. So as God has blessed us, we are called to be a blessing to other people. Amen. Yeah. As God has blessed us, we are called to be a blessing to other people. Do we know what time Sabbath school is supposed to go today? 10.30. 10. Okay. 10.30. Um, <clears throat> the last one is called preparing for death. And I would give you reference here would be 1 Kings 2, verses 1 through 4. <clears throat> and this is the story of David as he is coming to the end of his life. It says, when David's time to die drew near, he commanded Solomon his son, saying, I am about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong and show yourself a man and keep the charge of the Lord our God, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, and his testimonies, etc., etc. What is happening here? David is coming to the end of his life. What are the texts again? Uh, First Kings chapter 2, 1 through 4. Here is David coming to the end of his life, and he is, if you will, passing the torch on. He is having a conversation with his son and saying, son, don't make the same mistakes that I made. Walk in God's way. And um, <clears throat> it took a while for Solomon to figure that out himself, but nevertheless, I think David did that. So, I encourage you to consider this. Anticipate change. It is part of life. But um, God has promised his Holy Spirit to bless and guide us and to help us make good decisions. Let's stand and let's have prayer.
Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you are a God who is engaged in our lives, and I pray that you'll help us to make good decisions as we are faced with change. Bless us at each, of our, each step in our life, and may we be able to live to the fullest through your leading. Bless us as we continue to worship you this Sabbath, we pray in Jesus' name.